اللہم من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و بہی نستعین صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای یا رسول اللہ و علی اہل بیتک المدلومین صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای مولای و ابن مولای یا ابا عبداللہ یا رحمت اللہ الواسع و یا باب نجات الامہ یا غریب یا مذلوم یا اتشان کربلا ما خواب من تمسک بکم والامن من لجا الیکم سادتی یا لیتنا یا لیتنا کنا ماکم فنفوزا واللہ فوزا عظیم قال اللہ العظیم فی محکم کتابه الكریم والقول کالحق والاستق القائلین اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ولا تحسبن الذین قتلوا فی سبیل اللہ امواتا بل احیاء اند ربهم يرزقون آمنا باللہ صدق اللہ العلی العظیم صلو علی محمد و علی محمد Immediately following the tragedy of Karbala and that which transpired to the family of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, alayhi salatu was salam, there was this unique anxiety and stress within the Muslim community all across the world as far as the Muslim empire had spread. But how exactly could it have been done that only 50 years after the passing of the Messenger of God, his grandson Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib salamullahi alayhi had been massacred and butchered in the way that he was on the day of Ashura. Narrations and historical reports suggest that in the will of Muawiyah to his son Yazid, he writes to him and he says, and as for Hussein, try to get him to give you and pledge the allegiance to you, but make sure you don't mess with him. Because his connection, of course, is linked with the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this night, the night of the 12th of Muharram, actually on the day of the 12th of Muharram, Lady Zainab alayhi salam tells Imam Zainul Abideen, the first moment when he saw the body of his father, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, as the caravan of Lady Zainab alayhi salam was departing from Karbara to go to Kufa, Imam Zain al Abideen takes his first glance at the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and in what way? The body that had no head, that body that its parts had been dismembered, that body that had broken bones. It is stated that Imam Zain al-Abideen looks toward his aunt Zainab and says, Ammati sa'amut. That, oh my aunt, I think I'm going to die. To which Lady Zainab salam consoles her Imam and says, Oh son of my brother, don't worry. That because of the stance of your father, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, know that every day that passes that the location of this grave meaning this land and his stance is only going to become magnified due to the fact that your father is Nurullah he is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the light of Allah continues to illuminate and it continues to magnify and that's exactly what's happened that's exactly what transpired immediately after Ashura and every day, until that day, until this very day. Which is why we see what it is that we see. To the extent that we come out to the rituals and we perform the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that people doubt our sanity. That's okay. Because we're not going to allow for the message of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam to be forgotten. Not in our hearts and not in the eyes of anyone around us. 
And what we see immediately after Ashura, remember the way that we feel, there were also people during that day who lived with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam who were contemporaries of the Imam, who wished they could have been at battle, or who just chose not to be at the support of Imam al-Husayn for whatever their reason was. And we can get into some of those in a little while. But we see that many individuals, they came and they began to realize exactly who Banu Umayyah is, who is Yazid bin Muawiyah, who is Umar bin Sa'ad. And what we come towards stressing during the course of these days now until the Arba'een of Imam Hussein salam is the stance and the role of Imam al-Sajjad, the stance and the role of Lady Zainab salam in terms of what they did to really allow for the story of Karbara and the tragedy of Imam Hussein salam to continue again to have the station that it does, they would not stop talking about it for the remainder of their life in order not only to shed light on the tragedy of Aba Abdullah and Hussein, but also to make a stand against the rulers of their time to expose the fallacy that was Banu Umayyah. And demonstrate how they began to twist the reality of the religion of Islam. Because that what Imam al Hussein stands for, when we call him the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that never diminishes, it's because that everything that he did was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that he was opposing was darkness in its entirety. And thus anyone who linked with the light of Hussein manifests the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we're trying to do over here during these nights and during these days and during these gatherings. And we find that immediately again after the tragedy of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, this Clarity was brought toward the larger Muslim community in which, they really in, in which they really strove to do their best toward reconciling that which they failed Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and tried to make amends for the, uh, for the fact that they were not at the support of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And amongst those individuals who tried to make that stand that we want to speak about briefly this evening Firstly is the group known as the Tawabin, a group of individuals from Kufa who were unable or who chose not to come to the support of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam and realized that they should have made a greater effort towards supporting Aba Abdullah al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. And thus they call themselves the Tawabin or the repenters in order to make amends with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for not going towards supporting Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And the second amongst those is the revolution inspired by Muhtar ibn Ubayd al-Thaqafi. We talked about him a couple of nights ago. And the stance that he made against Banu Umayyah in order to work toward taking revenge for what happened to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his family in the massacre of Karbara. Some years after that, there were other revolutions inspired by these and really inspired again by the light of Hussein ibn Ali. For instance, the revolution of Zayd ibn Ali, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abideen, known as Zayd al-Shaheed. After him, we see his son Yahya ibn Zayd ibn Ali, meaning the grandson of Imam Zayn al-Abideen, the great-grandson of Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, who also wages a battle against the authorities of the time. And every single one of these revolutions that again were inspired by the inspiration of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam stance of mithli la yubayu a mithla that a man like me will never give allegiance to a man like Yazid or the words of Abi Abdullah al Hussein when he states hey hat min al that we will never accept humiliation to be ruled under an authority like this these words of Hussein alayhi salam they inspired the masses and thus one by one they came and they tried to wage battle against the authorities of their time. And like Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, every single one of them were massacred. With the exception perhaps of that of Muhtar al Thaqafi, which had some semblance of success. But again, none of them necessarily had the same maqam in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Someone says, why? How come we don't talk about Zayd? The same way we talk about Aba Abdullah. How can we don't talk, at, talk about the Tawabin? How can we don't talk about Muhtar al Thaqafi? Because none of them, they manifest the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. 
and that's Abi Abdullah al-Husayn salam alayhi. None of them, they did it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not to say that these individuals are not uh, individuals who have great uh, stations in the eyes of God. None of them are Hussein ibn Ali. None of them are Sayyid Shabab ahl jannah That his revolution is different. Because again, it's done for Allah. And that's what saved and preserved this religion. Anyhow, for our discussion this evening, inshallah, I want to talk about a couple of these revolutions after the day of Ashura that again were inspired by the charisma of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, and I want to do so in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding exactly what transpired after the tragedy of Kerbera. Secondly, in regards toward the stance or the uprising of the Tawabin and the details and their objectives. And thirdly, the objectives and the details surrounding the uprising of Muqtar al-Thaqafi. And basically where we can take some lesson from these uprisings and hopefully work toward applying them and shifting our worldview today, again taking inspiration from these noble individuals. Firstly, many people they ask, what exactly transpired to Banu Umayyah after the day of Ashura? Because we talk a lot about the stance of Imam Zain al-Abideen and their sermons the sermon of Imam Sajjad, and the sermon of Lady Zainab, and the sermon of Umm Kulthum, and the sermon of many of the daughters of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam, who on numerous occasions, they stood in front of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, they stood in front of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, they went back toward Medina, and they preached toward their local communities about that which transpired toward Imam al Hussein. Salamullah alayhi, these took place, the tragedy of Karbala takes place in the year 61 after Hijrah. And through the efforts of these two, Imam Zainal Abidin and Lady Zainab, peace be upon her, we come and we see that individuals, they again started to get exposed to the reality of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, of Banu Umayyah. We're talking 50 years after the passing of the Prophet. And I can't stress that enough. Somebody two days ago, they asked me, so it's not, who doesn't know the story so well? They're not Shia. They came and they asked me, so this Hussein that you come and that you weep over, and that you have these gatherings over. Was it his direct grandson? I said, yeah. It was his direct grandson. The son of the daughter of the Messenger of God. He lived with the Prophet ﷺ. She says, how come no one talks about it then? I don't know why doesn't nobody talks about it then. What I'm trying to say is, we're talking 50 years. 50 years is not a long time. Think about the reverence that we have for Imam Hussain ﷺ, though we never saw his face that we never heard his voice. Yet we still have this intense love that is incomparable. The same love that we have for the Prophet, the same love that we have for Ali. Even when someone that you lived with, who passes away, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon all of our deceased and give long life to all of those who are still alive from our family members, from our relatives. Eventually you get over it. You don't weep the same way, you don't grieve the same way, it doesn't affect you the same way. I said, yes, this is his direct grandson. She said, 50 years only? I said, 50 years. And she said, that's not a long time. I said, I know it's not a long time. That's what we're trying to say. What happened to the Muslim world? So through the efforts of Imam Zain al Abidin and through the efforts of Lady Zainab والسلام, and the conversations and the sermons, people began to get exposed to the reality of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And you would think that he's going to do his very best politically to making sure that he's not causing a bigger scene than he already did with massacring the son of the daughter of the messenger of God. But only two years later, in the year 63 after Hijrah, there was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Hanzala. Abdullah ibn Hanzala lives in the holy city of Medina. And he states that he wants to start an uprising against Banu Umayyah because they are an illegitimate authority over the Muslim world. Again, recognizing that Yazid ibn Muawiyah is an alcoholic, he's a womanizer, he's not someone who should claim to be the descendant or have the inheritance of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was embarrassing for the Muslim world that they have a leader like Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Like sometimes we're embarrassed to say that we're from the United States because of our leader. It was embarrassing for many people. So Abdullah bin Hanzala, he gathers together a few thousand people and he creates an army and he desires to wage war against Yazid bin Muawiyah's army, 
When Yazid heard about this, he lives in Damascus. He sends a group of approximately 15,000 people toward the holy city of Medina. Two years after Karbala, in the year 63 or 64 after Hijrah, they go under the leadership of a man by the name of Hasin ibn Namir. This is a man that I've mentioned on the day of Ashura. Hasin ibn Namir is one of the worst criminals that we have in human history. According to some narrations, he is the killer of Ali al-Akbar. According to others, he's also the killer of Habib ibn Madahar. He is the leader or the commander of one of the armies of Damascus under the authority of Umar ibn Sa'ad. And on the 10th of Muharram, when Imam al-Husayn was all alone, he came and he took an arrow and struck it through the throat of your master, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. That's who this man is. 15,000 people, they enter into the holy city of Medina, they massacre Abdullah ibn Hanzala and his contingency of the army, then they go into the mosque of the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they loot the mosque of the Prophet, they allow for animals to enter into it so they can urinate in the mosque of the Prophet, and they rape 1,000 women of Medina. And then they go toward the Holy Kaaba, they go to the city of Mecca, they go toward the Holy Kaaba, and under the instruction of Yazid in Damascus, they destroy the Holy Kaaba. Now I want you all to understand this for just one moment. Because when we take a look at early Islamic scholarship, there are individuals, for instance, like Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah who comes and he tries to justify the authority of Yazid ibn Muawiyah by stating that Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, he did what he did, but he should not have made a stand against the leader of his time. Demonstrating that Yazid ibn Muawiyah was a legitimate leader, because if someone was an illegitimate leader, natural law suggests that you have to stand up against that illegitimate leader. This is one. You have other scholars, for instance, on the flip side, like Ibn Hazm, who's a scholar from Andalus, who was, has real intense animosity, by the way, toward the followers of Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, who even he himself, he questioned the legitimacy of the authority of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but Ibn Taymiyyah does not. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say is, how can anyone come and they state the legitimacy of the authority of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, a man who comes and he uh, plights the mosque of the Messenger of God and he goes and he destroys the Kaaba and under his authority a thousand women are raped in the holy city of Medina. So when we go and we see the actions of a man like Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Ben Umayyah during that time, again, we're exposed to the reality of who these people were. Last year, as a quick parenthesis, last year we were having these Majadis gatherings and somebody came into the prayer room they were praying and then they decided to sit down. And I don't know what I said, but the next day he came to me when I was praying and he said, you said Yazid la'anatullahi alayh. You sent your curse and your condemnation upon Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He says, you know, you shouldn't do something like that. I said, Baba, what happens if someone were to treat your mother poorly? What would you think? You're going to let it go? Yazid ibn Muawiyah, let's say that you agree and establish his authority over Aba Abdullah al Hussein, and you forgive him for killing the grandson of the Messenger of God. You tell me if someone goes to the mosque of the Prophet وسلم, you're not even allowed to enter into it in a state of ritual impurity. You cannot enter into the state. You cannot enter into the mosque of the Prophet if you're in Janaba, for instance. You cannot enter into the Holy Kaaba, into the precinct of Mecca, again, if you're not in a state of ritual purity, if you're najis, it's haram, it's forbidden. And you're saying it's permissible for this man to go and destroy the Kaaba, because people don't know exactly the reality of Yazid. So they try their best, they try their best, they try their best to defend him in any way that they can. You defend the behavior of Yazid ibn Muawiyah in this battle known as the Battle of Harra, when he comes and destroys the army of Abdul ibn Hanzala, and fine, maybe we can justify the fact that he killed the son of the Messiah. In the year 65, it was the uprising known as again the uprising of the repenters, the Tawabi. It was led by a man by the name of Sulaiman ibn Surrad al Khuzai. Now this man is super important and it's really, really, really vital that we remember his name, Sulaiman ibn Surrad al Khuzai. He's an individual who's 88, between 88 and 93 years old. According to historical reports, 
He lives during the time of the Prophet وسلم, and was even a companion of the Messenger of God Though he himself was not from Medina, he himself was from Kufa. In the Battle of Jamal, he was amongst the supporters of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib And like other companions of Imam al Hassan, he was not amongst those who supported Imam al Hassan when he signs the treaty with Muawiyah. For those of you who know the story that Imam al Hassan goes to battle with Muawiyah, when he realizes that he doesn't have necessary support in his army, he signs a treaty with him in order to making sure that blood is not being shed unnecessarily. Many of the companions went toward Imam al Hassan and they said, Oh, son of the Messenger of God, why are you signing a treaty with Muawiyah? Imam al-Hassan said, be patient. He said, there's going to come a time when you need to stand with my brother. But right now, listen to what I say. This is strategy and you need to understand the strategy of the Imam. And we have numerous traditions, for instance, that tell us that what the Imam states, you have to submit to. And many of them, they didn't have that sense of ma'rafa of the Imam salam, including, for instance, companions like Hujr ibn Adi, who also protested Imam al-Hassan alayhi. Again, they made a mistake at that moment. They were fallible personalities. But nonetheless, they had a deep sense of respect and love and adoration for Ahlul Bayt. Sulaiman ibn Surad al Khuzai is in Kufa. Again, an elderly man between 88 and 93 years old. On the day of Ashura, many people they ask, where was this man? If he had the sense of respect, how come he wasn't in Karbara? And there are numerous different opinions about where Sulaiman ibn Surad al Khuzai was. Some state, for instance, that he was in the prison of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was the governor of Kufa. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is appointed governor of Kufa by Yazid ibn Ma'awi. And we're going to get into that in a, little bit more, in a couple of moments. And I'm sorry for throwing out all these names, but I just want to be able to give you a little bit of a glimpse into some of these revolutions. There's a lot of books and a lot of encyclopedias and a lot of articles that if you're interested to sort of getting into more depth about these things, I'm happy to speak with you afterwards. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is the governor of the city of Kufa and he began to start to imprison all of the followers of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, anyone who demonstrated any inkling of support to Muslim ibn Aqil. Remember Muslim ibn Aqil is dispatched by Imam al Hussein والسلام, from Medina to going toward Kufa, towards scoping out the situation because the Imam والسلام, receives upwards of 16,000 letters from Kufa inviting him to going toward Kufa so he can start his revolution there. Of course, Hura bin Yazid al-Riyahi captures the Imam السلام, and directs him toward Karbara, where he's eventually martyred on the 10th of Muharram. So, so according to one opinion of, of historians, they state that Sulaiman ibn Surad al khazai he is first of all one of those who wrote the letter inviting him, inviting Imam al Hussein to come toward Kufa. Some state, again, the first opinion was that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had imprisoned him like he had imprisoned thousands of other Shia. A second opinion states that Sulaiman ibn Surud al Khuzai, he was unable to escape Kufa because of how difficult it was to leave. And a couple of nights ago, I spoke about Habib ibn Mawahir al Asadi and how he leaves in the middle of the night to going toward Karbara, which, comes, which brings us toward the third opinion, and it's may be a strong opinion amongst many of our scholars of history in which they state that if someone really wanted to escape Kufa, if they were not in prison, they could have, like Habib ibn Madahar al-Asadi. How come Sulaiman ibn Surad al khazai did not put that effort toward escaping Kufa, to going toward Karbara, so he can defend Imam al Hussein? alayhi salatu wasalam. Either way, after the tragedy of Imam al Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, he felt real remorse for not putting forth, if we take this last opinion, all of his effort toward going towards supporting Aba Abdullah al Hussein. So he gathers together five of his close friends, every single one of them age 60 or above, meaning elders in the community who are scholars, who are uh, uh, very well reputed in the city of Kufa, all companions of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, because remember, Imam Ali, his governorship is in the city of Kufa. His capital is in Kufa. If you go toward Kufa, for instance, we go, we ask why is Imam Ali alayhi salam buried in Najaf? We go and we visit the mosque of Kufa, and we see the house of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and we see the area by which he ruled from, and so on and so forth. So the Imam salam alayhi, he transfers his capital toward Kufa, and thus many of these individuals, they spent a lot of time with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam alayhi. they all gather together, and they state 
that we need to make sure that we make amends for that which we did. Meaning, for not going to supporting Imam al Hussein salam alayhi. So they begin to strategize the way in which they're going to, in, in which they strove toward making sure that they go and they take vengeance for those who killed Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And specifically, they wanted to allow for an uprising in order that they're able to capture and kill Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad again, the capital, he's the, excuse me, the governor of the city of Kufa. Is everyone following what I'm saying so far? Let's recite one salawat. So what happens? In the year 62 after Hijrah, Sulaiman ibn Surud al-Khuzai begins to gather people. He begins to gather people and he begins to send letters toward people in Medina and people in Basra and all across the Muslim world. 16,000 people, they register to be amongst those who will support Sulaiman ibn Surrad al khuzai to going and starting a revolution against Banu Umayyah. In the year 65 after Hijrah, it is stated that Sulaiman ibn Surrad al khuzai he begins to instruct everyone from all across the Muslim world who had enlisted to be amongst the army again of the Tawwabin, they call themselves, those who are seeking repentance, he asked every single one of them to start gathering together and their central lo meaning location spot would be the grave of Imam al Hussein in the holy city of Karbara. So, 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 so this group of Tawabin from all across the Muslim world, they began to make their way toward the grave of Imam al Hussein. They took barakah from the grave of Sayyid al Shahada, they made his ziyara. They wept next to his grave. So Naiman ibn Sarad al Khazai, he states that our slogan in battle will be Ya li tharat al Hussein, O oh, for the vengeance of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Out of those 16,000 people, you know how many people showed up at the grave site of Imam al Hussein? 4,000 people. Out of 16,000, 4,000 people, they were committed toward taking vengeance against Banu Umayyah and they meet in a location between Syria and Iraq against the army of um, Umar, uh, excuse me, against the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah who again was dispatched by that same man, Hasin ibn Namir. In the battle known the, as the Battle of Ayn al-Warda and it is stated during the course of these three days because of how heavily outmatched the Tawabin were just about every single one of the army of Sulaiman ibn Surrad al khuzai was massacred during the course of three days, including Sulaiman himself. And we have many demonstrations and ahadith of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, that at least give us reference to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted their repentance. Though it's not very clear and though it's not very direct, scholars deduce from certain narrations from Imam Zain al-Abideen and from the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt عليهم, that state that the Tawabin was a revolution, though it was unsuccessful in terms of really going to or taking any sense of authority from Ben Umayyah, but their hearts were sincere. And they put forth their best effort, and inshaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted their effort. But again, during the course of three days, their entire army was massacred. And they were unable to really accomplish anything from a political lens. And that's why it's important to note this point really, really quickly. That the revolutions that transpired after the tragedy of Karbara and that of Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, there were of two types. We mentioned, for instance, Tawabin, we mentioned Muhtar al Thaqafi, we mentioned Zayd ibn Ali, we mentioned Yahya ibn Zayd, and then we mentioned or if we go into books of history, we find numerous others who come from the lineage of Zayd ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib Salamullah alayhi. And many of these, again, they took these two unique forms of variation. The first variation of these revolutions were, were, were led by individuals who were sincere, who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who loved his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala, who were scholars in their own right, like that of Sulaiman ibn Surah al-Khuzai, but many of them didn't have any sense of authority when it came to politics. They didn't know how to run an army. They were elderly men, for instance, Sulaiman ibn Surud al khuzai between 88 to 93 years old, right? How can a man of that age go out and lead an entire battle, lead an entire army, right? Especially when he's not from amongst the sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi, of course, they have a different sense of authority and a different charisma. And I don't mean our friend Ali, who also just comes from the lineage of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm talking about the children of Ali, 
Abu al-Fadl Abbas and his brothers with that sense of bravery and that sense of charisma. Anyhow, we come and we see then the third dimension and that is the uprising of Muhtar al-Thaqafi. And again, every single one of these have been studied for many years and there are many books and articles and so on and so forth that are written about them. But it's important for us to have a sense of insight in regards to a little bit of who these personalities were. So again, the Tawabin in three days in the year 65 after Hijrah, they're eradicated and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, accept their forgiveness. And according to numerous traditions, again, there is a demonstration or, an, or, 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 or seemingly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it and that Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wa salam, were pleased with them. And then that brings me again then toward the revolution of Muhtar ibn Ubayd al-Thaqafi. Mukhtar ibn Ubayd al-Thaqafi, his revolution begins in the year 67 after Hijrah. But before we get into exactly what transpired, who is this personality, Mukhtar ibn Ubayd al-Thaqafi? According to historical reports, he was born in the city of Ta'if, Ta'if, which is close to the city of Mecca. And his father, Abi Ubayd al-Thaqafi, comes from this really reputable tribe in Ta'if known as al thaqif and it is stated that Abu Ubaid was amongst the really close companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was also a really close companion of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib ﷺ. Both him, meaning the father of Mukhtar, and his mother, they were incredibly wealthy and they had built very good relationships with a lot of wealthy landowners from across the Muslim world both that in Mecca and in Medina, but even more so in Iraq. So they were, came from already a wealthy family and Muhtar al-Thaqafi was born to them. And when he was born, it is stated that Abu, Abi Ubaid, he takes Muhtar toward the Prophet wasallam in order that the Prophet makes some dua on behalf of him, as we might do for instance, to elder in the family and so on and so forth. And it is stated that the Prophet ﷺ makes a dua for Mukhtar, and which many scholars or many individuals would state that again, this is one of the means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Mukhtar the tawfiq to do what it is that he did in terms of creating and standing or making the stance for this uprising against Banu Umayyah. So what happens? After Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib ﷺ, he again establishes his authority, his capital in the city of Kufa, Mukhtar al Thaqafi, he leaves and he also goes to live in Kufa. Imagine, for instance, that Imam al Zaman, Ajrullah ta'ala faraja, he comes back and he settles anywhere in this world. We all want to live next to him. Even if he settles in New Jersey, we'll all move to New Jersey <laughs> and we'll all go live with Imam al Zaman, Ajrullah ta'ala faraja. Why not? Right? We'd we'll go wherever the Imam alayhi salam does. And we come and we see, for instance, that when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he moves and he migrates toward the city of Kufa, many of those close companions and comrades of his, they also move toward the city of Kufa so they can live next to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, he actually is so close to Imams al-Hasan and al-Hussein that during those four or five years in the city of Kufa, he would spend time with them, whereby some historians would state that they interacted like they were family meaning that they have a really close sort of uh, relationship between Mukhtar and Imams Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein alayhim salatu wassalam. Now again, I know that many people have watched that series on the life of Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, which is 40 something parts, and it's very, very good. But not all of it is entirely accurate. And that's why it's super important again to understand who is Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Though again, you get some of these glimpses during the course of that, uh, during the course of that series. Muhtar al-Thaqafi, he lives in the city of Kufa, and again, he is really close towards al-Imams al-Hasan and al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And it's also important to note that his wife is the daughter of Nu'man ibn Bashir. You know who Nu'man ibn Bashir is? Again, again, sorry for throwing out all of these names, but it's super integral for us to know these names when we're understanding the entire picture of Karbala. Nu'man ibn Bashir, he was the governor of Kufa after the, after the martyrdom of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, meaning he was appointed by Banu Umayyah to be the governor of the city of Kufa. This is again now after the passing of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi. And when Yazid bin Muawiyah takes rule and he hears about the number of letters that have been sent upwards of 16,000 to Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi, 
Yazid ibn Muawi, again, he tells this man, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who was then the governor of Basra, to go toward Kufa and remove Nu'man ibn Bashir because Nu'man ibn Bashir was a decent man. And he wasn't an individual who ruled with an iron fist. And he wasn't an individual who had such animosity toward Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu I'm not saying that he was right. I'm not saying that he was forgiven for what it is that he did or the fact that he worked with Banu Umayyah. What I am trying to state is that he was not a harsh ruler. And Yazid needed Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad to go because he would not be afraid to kill a man like Muslim ibn Aqih. Everyone follow it. So Nu'man ibn Bashir is the father-in-law of Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Mukhtar also has two sisters. Now again, in order to understand how integral that this person is, understand that his father-in-law was the previous governor of Kufa. His two sisters are both married to two incredibly reputable people in the Muslim world. One of them is from Kufa, a man by the name of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad, the general of the army, against Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, is the brother-in-law of Muhtar al His second sister is married to Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, who lives in Medina. So Muhtar al his family relations now, his in-laws, are all incredibly reputable. They have a high sort of presence. People know about them. Whether we support some of them like Umar ibn Saad or not, that's besides the point. The important point to note again is that Muhtar al not only is he a wealthy individual who comes from, an, um, who, who comes for the, who comes from the aristocracy, He's now migrated to the city of Kufa, has deep relationships with Imams al Hassan and al Hussein, peace and blessings be upon them. His father was a companion of the Prophet and of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But again, due to that love that he had for Ahlul Bayt, wasalam, when Muslim ibn Aqil was dispatched from Mecca, from Medina, to going toward Kufa, where did he stay when he entered into the city of Kufa? He stayed in the house of Muhtar al Thaqafi. Muslim ibn Aqil, who is the representative of Imam al Hussein, he lives in the house of Muhtar al Thaqafi. Is everybody following? Okay. He lives in the house of Muhtar al Thaqafi during those days. So someone says, Muslim ibn Aqil on the 8th of the month of the Hijjah was killed. What happened to Muhtar if Muhtar was the one who was housing him? Then how come he also wasn't killed? Now, this is an important point. Muslim ibn Aqil, he goes around the streets of Kufa, as we narrate in the Masa'ib, which we did not do in the course of these nights, but for those of you who know, and for those of you who don't know, make sure that you are really well versed in this aspect of Islamic history. This really lays an important foundation for what happened on the 10th of Muharram. Muslim ibn Aqil, when he gets toward Kufa, he goes house to house looking for supporters. And he had many. He had many, remember 16,000 people are writing letters toward Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Of course, some of them were not sincere. Some of them, they just wanted Imam al Hussein salam, to come to Kufa because they didn't like Yazid or they didn't like Ubaidullah ibn Zaid. Not because they're ready to give their life for Aba Abdullah al Hussein, but just because they had a difference in political ideology toward Banu Umayyah or because they lost their own political positions and so on and so forth. And they would write on behalf of their entire tribe, you come back, restore us position, and our entire thousand people in our tribe are going to do our best to supporting you all, Abu Abdullah. Again, not in a way that they cared about Imam al Hussein because he is Nurullah fi Arullah. Anyhow, so Muslim ibn Aqil, he goes in the streets of Kufa along with a couple of his other companions in order to making sure that they're gathering together so they're able to prepare for the arrival of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam that would start this uprising in Kufa against Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, gathering together these thousands of people so they could eventually go and form this uprising against Yazid ibn Muawiyah in Damascus. During the course of that effort by Muslim ibn Aqil, he dispatched some of his closest companions to the outskirts of the city of Kufa, to going and finding other individuals who were ready to come towards supporting this mission. Amongst those who he sent outward were Muhtar al Taqafi. When Muhtar returns back to Kufa, he finds that Muslim ibn Aqil had already been killed. And immediately he is brought toward the court of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and he is put in prison for five years. When did Ashura take place? In the year 61 after Hijrah. In the year 60 after Hijrah, before the day of Ashura, Muhtar al Thaqafi is imprisoned for five years. In prison, he meets a man by the name of Mitham al Tamar. Who is Mitham al Tamar? 
the legendary companion of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salamullah alayhi. For those of you who have been to Kufa, for those of you who have been to Kufa, if you have not been, December 23rd to January 2nd, Please let me know, inshallah, we'll go and we'll visit all of these sites and a lot of these things will be made clear. When we go to Najaf, we go to visit Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salamullah alayhi. We drive a 15 or 20 minute drive toward the city of Kufa. In the city of Kufa, we go and we visit numerous historical sites. Amongst those historical sites is the Mosque of Kufa. In the Mosque of Kufa, there are several personalities buried. Who are some of these personalities? Muslim ibn Aqeel, Muhtar al-Thaqafi, Hani ibn Urwa, we have these three individuals who are buried in the mosque of Kufa, all supporters of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Near to the mosque of Kufa, maybe a seven or eight minute walk, there is the grave of Mitham al-Tamar. Mitham al-Tamar, that man who allowed for his life to be in dedication to Ali ibn Abi Talib salamullah alayhi, he was also in prison during the day of Ashura. Thus he was unable to support his master, Aba Abdullah al-Hussein salamullah alayhi. And it is stated that Mitham al-Tamar and Muhtar al-Thaqafi, they begin to discuss and they begin to converse. And I don't want to get into too much detail about what it is that transpired between their conversations and what sort of wisdom was brought by Mitham al-Tamar toward Muhtar al-Thaqafi. Anyhow, during the time that Muhtar al-Thaqafi was in prison, historical reports they state that when the caravan of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam and Lady Zainab was brought toward the city of Kufa, it is stated that they went and they took the heads of all of the companions of Imam al-Hussein and Aba Abdullah al-Hussein himself and showed it toward the prisoners, of, in the, in, in, the prisoners in the jails of Kufa in order to tell them that if you make a stand against us, this is what's going to happen to you. And the minute that Muhtar al-Thaqafi saw the head of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam on that spear, he swore that he is going to take He's going to make his very best effort toward defending what happened toward Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. For five years he's in prison. Muhtar al-Thaqafi, he writes a letter to his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab. He states, oh my dear brother-in-law, you have a really important responsibility in the Muslim world. He states, do your very best to get me out of prison. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab didn't have any relationship with Muhtar al-Thaqafi. But Muhtar would write numerous letters to his sister and said, please persuade your husband to do something to get me out of prison. So eventually she worked her influence and had Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab write a letter toward Yazid. When he read the letter, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab still has a sense of respect within the Muslim world. He writes a letter toward Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa and says, let go of this Muhtar, let's not make this a big deal. Muhtar al-Thaqafi, he leaves the prison of Kufa and immediately he gathers together some of his closest companions and comrades and they be of Kufa and also all across the Muslim world and they begin to make their way and they strive towards starting a revolution against Banu Umayyah. Now again, the details of it, you can watch it in that film or you can go and read about it in a book which would be a lot better because reading is good for you. And you go and you see, again, without, taking, without going into so much detail about what transpired, the difference between the revolution of Muhtar and that of the Tawabin was that Muhtar al-Thaqafi wasn't only interested in taking vengeance for what happened toward Ahlul Bayt, wasalam, but he was also interested in establishing a state. He was interested in establishing a government that was in the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. Now what's really, really important to note, or what's really, really important for people to question as well, is that what gives this man the right to go in leading, to, to, to go in establishing an Islamic government, and he did, because he overthrew Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa, and he established his own government in the city of Kufa, until eventually he was killed in the year 68 after Hijrah by the authorities of Banu Umayyah who, again, come from Damascus. Someone might ask the question, Muhtar al-Thaqafi, if he was so loyal, if he was so sincere, when he became the leader of Kufa, again, after he kills Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he kills Shimr ibn Dil-Joshan, he kills Umar ibn Sa'ad, he kills Khuli or Khuwali, the individual who was responsible for the head of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein after the 10th of Muharram, and according to tradition, the states that he killed 
His army killed 18,000 people. Out of the 30,000, some would state there immediately from those 30,000 who killed Aba Abdullah and Hussein alayhi salam, or there were comrades or individuals who supported from behind the scenes. Either way, he kills 18,000 people during the course of a year in order again to take revenge for what happened to Imam al-Hussein. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, Umar ibn Sa'ad, Shimr ibn Dirjoshin, Hurmala ibn Kahl, Holy, every single one of those top ranking uh, military commanders was under the authority of Muhtar al -Daqafi. Someone which says, how come he didn't give that authority to Imam Zain al-Abidin Good question. How come he does not give the authority to Imam Zain al-Abidin This is one question. And there are numerous different answers. Someone would state that Muhtar al-Thaqafi was not sincere, that rather Muhtar al-Thaqafi, in the name of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wasalam, what he did was he used their name. Yes, he might have done this good deed, but he had a sense of pride in him and he wanted himself to be the leader and he himself wanted to be the face of the revolution. And many, even among scholars within the school of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wasalam, they take this opinion about Muhtar al-Thaqafi. My understanding and the understanding of many others as well is that Muhtar al-Thaqafi alayhi salatu wasalam, rather his stance was very unique and his position was very unique and everything about his life was always thinking about a strategy. He had a really close relationship with Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, who was the brother of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the half brother of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, who did not go and fight on the day of Ashura but remained back in the city of Medina. And he utilized Muhammad ibn an Hanafiya to get instruction from Imam Zain al Abidin according to one opinion or according to numerous historical narrations as well. Others would state that the fact that Imam Zain al-Abideen never publicly supported him or never gave any sense of public support to him in the same way that he did to the Tawabin means the authority or the stance of Muhtar al-Thaqafi was illegitimate. And we have evidence to support this notion as well. Let me give you an example. There are numerous ahadith which tell us from Imams al-Baqir and al-Sabiq in which they do la'an of Muhtar al-Thaqafi, which they curse and condemn the actions of Muhtar al-Thaqafi by stating that Muhtar, he lied upon us. He used our name for his own personal gain. And many people, they say, but how come Muhtar, we go and we visit his grave and we touch it and we take tabarruk from it, so on and so forth. Again, there are many within uh, our ideology who state that they will absolutely not do that. And when we go toward these ahadith and we go toward these traditions, there are two different opinions. Again, or the three different appearance. The first opinion is that they're valid, that Muhtar al-Thaqafi was not someone who was praised within our tradition. A second opinion, and this is the opinion of Sayyid al-Khu'i, he says that every single one of the hadiths that condemn Muhtar al-Thaqafi, they're all mursal al-Sanad, they're all da'if, they're all weak, or they all don't reach a clear cut train of transmission back toward the Imam, thus we can take every single one of these traditions and throw them against the wall. Meaning that they don't have any sense of value. And for those of you who understand the signs of hadith, then you'd understand what it means when they say, throw it against the wall. And the third opinion, this is the opinion of many, including my teacher, Sayyid Muhammad Taqal Madarasi, in which, he, in which they state, for instance, that these ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, of Imam Al-Baqir, and the Sadiq alayhi salam, they might be authentic. Or we, can, we, might, we may be able to trace them back toward the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. But when the Imams, they condemned and they cursed Muhtar al-Thaqafi, they did it publicly in Taqiyya. Because they did not want anyone from Banu Umayyah to go and associate Muhtar al-Thaqafi with Ahlul Bayt So they distanced themselves from them in public in order to make sure that there was not a vigilant eye over their behavior when they were scheming against Banu Umayyah. Think about how difficult, and this is, this is a really, really important point, my friends. Think about how difficult it was for the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, to even express their grief for Imam Al-Hussein Sorry, is this ringing too loud? How difficult it was to express grief over Imam Al-Hussein and, 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 and to gather in gatherings like this one. Alayhi salatu wasalam would have to distance certain personalities who were really close to them in order that the vigilant eye of the government would not be over them. Let me give you an example. Two personalities. One personality, a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Muslim, 
couple of nights ago, I talked about Muhammad ibn Muslim, companion of Imam al-Sadiq who was the faqih of Kufa, he was the marja of Kufa, so to say. And when he comes toward Imam al-Sadiq or Imam al-Baqir the Imam tells him that humble yourself and then he goes outside and he begins to sell those dates. Remember I told you guys the story? Muhammad ibn Muslim is one of our most important fuqaha. He's one of our most important narrators of ahadith. We have instances within our ahadith where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they curse Muhammad ibn Muslim, number one. A second personality, a man by the name of Zurara ibn A'yun. Imam al-Sadiq says, if it were not for Zurara, the religion of my forefathers would not exist today. He was that central in terms of narrating ahadith from Imam al-Baqir We have traditions whereby Imam al-Baqir would curse Zurara. Again, he would do so in the public gathering of the Umayyad or the Abbasid later on in order to distance these personalities. But in reality, those who knew, they knew the reality of who they were. And again, the sanctity of sort of keeping the message alive and how secretly it, how it have to be transmitted is super important. And one of those personalities, perhaps, is Muqtar al So he wages this battle with upwards of 14 to 16,000 individuals. They overthrow Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and they take vengeance for more than 18,000 individuals who were directly or indirectly associated with the slaughtering of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam until Muhtar himself is killed by the army of Musayyib ibn Zubair. And it is stated that when the news had come toward Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was killed, and Umar ibn Sa'd was killed, and Hurmala ibn was killed, and Shimr was killed. When the news had come to Imam Zain al Abidin salam in the first week of Rabi al Awwal in the year 67 after Hijrah, the Imam salamullah alayhi fell to the ground and he began to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the nightmare that those personalities brought toward Ahlul Bayt salam, was over. And again, this gives us some demonstration that number one, the Imam salam, was satisfied with the actions of Muhtar. A second one states that one of the sons of Muhtar later on would go toward visiting Imam al-Baqir. And he states, O grandson of the Messenger of God, we have received report that you have condemned our father. To which he responds, Rahimallah abaka, Rahimallah abaka, Rahimallah abak. He states, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon your father. For he is the one who brought a sense of peace to our hearts when our hearts were trembling with that which transpired on the day of Ashura. And what happened to Imam al-Hussein What suffering did Ahlul Bayt والسلام, have to go through during the course of these days and these nights? Literally, when I told you all my friends that the tragedy of Imam al-Hussein it begins now. It didn't begin or it's more intensified now than it was on the first of Muharram. That's the reality. I know that many people didn't come today because they're tired. And I know that every single one of you are tired and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for coming to the Majlis of Hussein. And when I was coming in earlier today, I was thinking, man, I'm so exhausted. I'm losing my voice, I'm not feeling so well. But you know, the thought that came to my mind, how did Zainab feel on this night? How tired was Zainab If I lost my voice for reciting the majlis of Hussein what happened to the voice of Zainab when she was crying out the call of Ya Hussein? What did the children feel on a night like tonight? The night of the 12th of Muharram. The narration states that on the night of the 12th of Muharram, again, the family of Ahlul Bayt they had lost everything. And Zainab السلام, was so exhausted, she had not slept for days. But even on this night, she did not miss performing the night prayer. Lady Zainab السلام, narration state that she exited from that tent, but really what tent? It was the tent that was already burnt to the ground. In front of all of the dismembered body parts of her family members, which still had not been picked up one day later, Zainab السلام, she sat on the plains of Karbala because she did not have the energy to stand. And she raised her hands in Qunut and she called out, Rabbana taqabbal minna, O oh Allah, accept the sacrifice from us. Lady Zainab on the 12th of Muharram, meaning on the day of, day of tomorrow, 
It is stated that she was instructed by the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad along with Imam Zain al-Abideen to making sure that they collect all of the family members and all of the women and all of the children. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he sends Shimur and he dispatches her to, and he dispatches him toward Imam Zain al-Abideen and toward Lady Zainab alayha salam. And Shimur goes toward Lady Zainab salamullah alayha and says, Oh Zainab, gather together all of the women and the children. And she says, for what? And he says, because we're going to take you toward Kufa. And at that moment, Lady Zainab alayha salam, she begins to gather together the women and the children. They were tired, they were exhausted. And when they were not moving quickly enough, Shimur bin Dil Joshin would take a whip and strike the backs of these women and these children. <laughs> After everything that he had already done, Zainab alayha salam had to receive the whips of Shimur bin Dil Joshin on a night like tonight and on a day like tomorrow. And it is stated that on the 12th of Muharram, as they were leaving the city of Kufa, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he instructed his army that to make sure that they take the women and the children through the battlefield. And for many of them, it was the first time that they saw the body parts of their family members. Again, those body parts that did not have a head. Imagine you're a mother and you see your child, but your child doesn't have any head, then the only thing that you see is their precious body. That's how Layla felt when she saw the body of Ali al-Akbar. That's how Ramla felt when she saw the body of Qasim. One by one, every single one of these women, they see the body parts of their husbands and of their brothers and of their cousins and of their nephews and of their children. Until they saw the body of Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. But that body looked unique from all of the other bodies. Let me tell you why. Because the body of Imam al Hussein on the night of the 11th of Muharram had been trampled by the horses. And you know, not only a trampling takes place, but the bones of that body were broken as well. And like I mentioned to you on the day of Ashura, that Hurmala ibn Kari takes a three-pronged arrow which strikes the chest of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. When Imam al Hussein tried to remove it from the front, he couldn't do so, and the, and the arrow broke. So he pulled out that arrow from behind him. Do you know what that did toward the heart of Imam al Hussein? Which is why the narration states that blood began to gush out of the chest of Imam al Hussein. So when those horses trampled over the body, what body was it already of Abu Abdullah? What already happened to the bones of Imam al Hussein? And Imam Zain al Abidin, who was ill, again he had to take a glance at the body of his father Abba Abdullah. So Kaina had to see what happened to the body of her father Abba Abdullah and Hussein. But none of this is as tragic as what transpired on the 13th of Muharram as Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam he returns back toward Karbala to go toward burying the body of his father Abba Abdullah al Hussein. It is said that he goes toward Banu Asad, the tribe that, re that resided in the city of Karbala. They go toward him and they say, O grandson of the Messenger of God, how can we help you? And they go and they begin to help to bury all of the companions of Imam al Hussein in one location. And then he says, Bury all of Banu Hashim in this location. Banu Asad, they said, We'll keep the body of Habib ibn Madahar in this location. And at that moment, there was wet one body again that had been trampled by the horses that was indented into the ground. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, Oh Banu Asad, leave this body to me. But before I go and I take the body of my father and bury it, give me two things. Things. He said, they said, oh, oh, oh Ali ibn Hussein, what do you want? He said, one thing that I want is a prayer cloth. And the second thing that I want is a piece of iron or a piece of metal. So they go and they bring a cloth for Imam, Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. And they bring this piece of steel for Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Do you know what Imam Zain al-Abideen need, needed that steel for? He needed to undig the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, which again had been indented into the ground. And you know what he had to do with that piece of cloth? He had to pick up the body parts of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He had to pick up that finger that was cut on the night of the 11th of Muharram, he had to pick up the chest of Abba Abdullah, he had to pick up the limbs of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam because due to the trampling and due to the tragedy, they were scattered all over that location. But one body part of Imam al Hussein was not present, that was the head of Abba Abdullah that had reached Kufa. 
So it is stated that he goes and he takes the cloth and he picks up the body parts. But when Asad, they come toward him, they say, Oh, Ali ibn Hussein, how can we help you? He said, leave it, leave this one to me, don't worry about it. He enters into the grave and he goes and he puts the body of Imam al Hussein into the grave. And he's there for a really long time. Banu Asad, they come and they want to know what Imam Zain al Abidin is doing for such a long time. They're worried about him. So they enter and they look into the grave and they see that Imam Zain al Abidin is trying to kiss his father farewell. But in what way? Usually, when you have a family member who passes away, you kiss them on the forehead, you kiss them on the cheek when you're burying them. Imam Zain al Abidin didn't know what to do, so Banu Asad narrated that he began to kiss the jugular vein of his father, Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He exits from the grave and he writes on top of the grave, Hada Qabr Abi Abdullah al Hussein, Walidi Alladi Qutila Achana. He said, This is the grave of my father, Abba Abdullah, who I want all of the world to know die thirsty on the day of Ashura. At that moment, it is said that Imam Zainul Abideen. He thanks Banu Asad for their support. And then Banu Asad, they think that their task is done. To which Imam Zain al Abidin looks toward them and he says that we have one more place to go. They say, Oh Ali ibn Hussein, where do we have to go? He said, There's the uncle, there's the body of my uncle Abil Fadl al Abbas by the Euphrates that we still did not bury. They say, Oh Imam Zain al Abidin, how come we didn't take his body and bring it back toward Banu Hashim? He says, Because my sister Sakaina, he made that will and that promise to Abba Abdullah that he did not want the body to return back toward the tent. So we'll leave the body of Abil Fadl al Abbas to the Euphrates. على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala with this grief and with this love for Imam al Hussein عليه السلام to accept us from amongst the servants. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to accept these gatherings and these majalis over the last twelve nights from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the opportunity to serve Imam al Hussein every day and every year during these days of Ashura. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of those who came and took part in the majlis of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase the wealth of all of those who donated to the majlis of Imam al Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for our tears and for our help and for our volunteering and for our support and for our grief and for our broken hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with one haja and that is that we are able to visit Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in this life. And that we attain the intercession of Imam al Hussein in the next life. And that we are raised with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his grandfather and his father and his mother and his brother in paradise. And that we reside with them therein. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina muhammadin wa ala ahla baytahi tayyibina al-tahreen. If I could ask you all to recite one surat al-Fatiha, but before that, one surat al-Fatiha for all of those who died yesterday in the holy city of Karbala as they were making ziyara of Imam al Hussein. The 35 individuals and all of those uh, of our marhumin, those who have passed before us. Rahimallah, uh, man qara'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatah. <laughs>